All right, good evening and welcome to NSHSS's webinar with ACOM. Um, I am seeing a lot of you filing in as we speak, so I'll give everyone a couple of minutes to get in uh, and we'll get started in just a few minutes. Thank you for your patience. While you're waiting for all of your friends to join you, if you have time uh, or a second, if you want to fill out the webinar poll uh, and just let us know that prior to tonight, uh, have you heard of osteopathic medicine? Just a quick yes or no, and that'll kind of help me guide my discussion this evening with all of you. Oh, perfect. So Grace, if you want to close that poll and maybe just flash the results for me really quickly, that would be awesome. And then I'll go ahead and get things kicked off. Perfect. So about half of you have heard about osteopathic medicine and the other half have not, which is awesome. Um, first, let me thank you for filling out that poll. And Grace, when you're ready, you can go ahead and take that down. And I will kick tonight off by welcoming you to um, all the things you thought you knew about osteopathic medicine. Um, we're going to really dive into osteopathic medicine. What is osteopathic medicine? Um, what are the different pathways to becoming a fully licensed doctor or physician in the US? And so much more. So thank you for being here tonight. My name is Erin Helbling. I serve as the Associate Director of Recruitment and Outreach at ACOM or the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine. And I know that's a mouthful, so a lot of us um, just refer to our, our association as ACOM. Um, who is ACOM? Who are we? So we are the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine, and we provide many services to our 37 member colleges of osteopathic medicine nationwide. So we have 37 uh, medical schools, across the US with 58 teaching locations in 33 states. Our association is probably most famous for running the ACOMIS application. So most pre-med um, or medical students and even free health advisors that you'll work with when you get to college know us as the team that runs ACOMIS. ACOMIS is the centralized online application service for all US colleges of osteopathic medicine. So what does ACOMIS do? It basically simplifies the process of applying to osteopathic medical school. You would complete one application. It's kind of like a common application for colleges. Um, you complete one application and then you send it with required information to our centralized service. Your student, uh, excuse me, once we get all of your information and your application materials, we will verify it to make sure everything you've entered is correct. And then once we've done that, we've sent it to the colleges of medicine. We won't get into the nitty gritty of the application process because you probably won't have to think about that for a couple more years. Um, you're probably just really wanting to know a little bit about osteopathic medicine and um, learn about a new uh, field of healthcare. So that's what we're gonna spend most of our time on tonight. So throughout this entire presentation, I promise to do my best to teach you about what osteopathic medicine is. And when you have questions after this presentation or in the future, I really want to make sure that you have the best places to visit to get accurate information about our medical profession. As we all know, with the media and today's world, there's a lot of misinformation out there, and I want to make sure that you have the best information. So with that said, the number one site I want you to be aware of after our presentation today is ChooseDO.org. 
ChooseCO.org is your one-stop shop for all things osteopathic medicine and honestly, all things pre-med. Um, now, the second thing I want you to do, other than remember ChooseCO, is to pull out your phones. Uh, I know most of you are more than likely very active on social media, as most young people are. Um, so I want you to pull out your Instagram and give acom underscore do a quick follow. This account is awesome. It gives all things pre-medical information. It tells you all about osteopathic medicine. There's highlights on our some of our current students and current physicians. We're always posting great tips for pre-med students, blog posts, current medical students, and more. So definitely give us a follow. And now that you have the best way to get accurate information after we part ways tonight, let's get into the nitty gritty. So what exactly is osteopathic medicine? So as you guys showed me prior to hopping on this or getting started, um, about half of you have heard about osteopathic medicine before tonight and about half of you haven't, which is awesome. Um, but for that 50% that didn't know about osteopathic medicine or even the 50% that already did, um, you have to partner with me tonight because it's, it's something we have to change in the US. With your help, assuming that I do my job properly over the next hour, after tonight, you'll be able to educate your family members and your friends all about what osteopathic medicine is. At the end of my entire spiel, there's only one thing that I want you to remember. That is that a DO is equal to an MD. Please, please, please don't let anyone try to tell you differently because the fact of the matter is that they are trying, if they are trying to tell you that a DO is not equal to an MD, they are simply not educated on the subject and the facts or the truth about osteopathic medicine. And one of my favorite medical students, I actually work with a lot of medical students still to this day, and one of my favorite students told me something once and I wanna share it with you. I asked him, I was like, why do you wanna be a DO instead of an MD on your, on your way to becoming a doctor? And he said, well, Aaron, um, a DO is like an MD plus. So a DO is equal to an MD and then some. Osteopathic medicine is a distinct pathway to medical practice in the United States. So osteopathic medicine provides all the benefits that you can possibly imagine of modern medicine, including prescription drugs, surgery, the use of technology to diagnose disease, and evaluate injury. But it also offers the benefit of hands-on diagnosis and treatment through a system of treatment called, or known as, osteopathic manipulative medicine. So if you hear me say OMM tonight, OMM is osteopathic manipulative medicine. Osteopathic medicine, the philosophy, really emphasize, emphasizes helping each person achieve a high level of wellness by focusing on health profession, excuse me, health promotion and disease prevention. So like I said, Doctors of osteopathic medicine are fully licensed physicians or doctors, whichever you prefer, who emphasize a whole person approach to treatment and care. DOs are really trained from day one that they start medical school to partner and listen to, partner with and listen to their patients and help them get healthy and stay well. There are approximately 121,000 fully licensed and active practicing osteopathic doctors or physicians nationwide. And we'll get into more, we'll, we'll dive deeper into the OMM piece um, as we go on to the, uh, throughout this presentation. So I just told you a little bit about what osteopathic medicine is and gave you a real like 60 foot view of, of what it is. You've heard me tell you what it is, but you might be thinking to yourself, so what exactly is a DO and really why have I never heard of it before? Quite simply, a DO is a physician or a doctor. I can't stress that enough. DOs make up 11% of all the physicians in the United States and 25%, that means a fourth, of all medical students in the U.S. are currently training to become a DO. Instead of what is a DO though, I think the better question is who is a DO? And with that, I'd like to introduce you to a couple of physicians that I know and love working with. Um, these are just a couple of our physicians though, so this does not necessarily represent all of our physician workforce as far as DOs go. 
So this is Dr. Ronald Block, who was the 39th Surgeon General of the United States Army and is a surgeon by trade. Meet Dr. Jen Cottle. She's a family physician and a professor of medicine in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Meet Dr. Mike. We call him Dr. Mike fondly because of his Instagram presence, but he's another family physician in New York who is actually, like I said, quite famous. One of my favorites, Dr. Nee Darko. Dr. Nee Darko is a board certified general surgeon who is pushing past the limits of the status quo. Dr. Renee Volney Darko. Dr. Volney Darko is an OBGYN or an obstetrician gynecologist. And when she's not delivering babies or doing surgery, she specializes in empowering pre-medical students with strategies to optimize their chances of getting into medical school. And last but not least, Dr. Richard Shuri. He's a doctor at NASA, where he ensures our astronauts' health and safety pre and during their missions to, to space. My point here is, there are DO physicians all over the United States treating patients in every specialty and in super cool ways. They may be in surgeons, primary care specialists, dermatologists, OBGYN, you name it, DO physicians practice it. Now, while I could go on all night about what osteopathic medicine is and why you should consider it as a career option, I really truly believe that no one says it better than our own physicians and our current students. So I'm going to play a quick video for you. From the first day of medical school in our osteopathic colleges, we are taught you will approach every single person in a whole body manner. Those philosophies are ingrained into your core, and that's a very, very powerful tool. No matter what specialty practice you go into, you will always maintain the osteopathic approach. When you treat someone, you're not treating the disease, you're treating the patient. And by looking at them from a mental standpoint, from a physical standpoint, and a spiritual standpoint, there are many times that someone has multiple comorbidities, and you need to be able to look at all aspects of that and treat them as a whole. We look at the patient, what they're involved in in their life. Um, are they married? Do they have a big family? That is one of the most important things involved in people's health is their life. And so I wanted to have that approach going into being a physician. If the nation calls at least for at our base as far as from a healthcare perspective, then it's my responsibility and our squadron's responsibility to try to make sure those folks are ready to go pretty quickly. We do have a lot of muscle skeletal related injuries. And so for me, as far as osteopathic profession, specifically with the OMT, is when I think I can add more benefit and value because of the additional set of anatomy and palpatory skills that we learn. And so being unafraid to lay hands on patients and try to treat them without necessarily giving them medication because some of the times the medications that we prescribe can also cause them not to be able to do their duty for a certain period of time. I love making people feel the way that I would want to feel and the way that my family members would want to feel. And I think as a physician, it is of utmost importance to be a compassionate physician. I want to be the team leader that people just look at and say, wow, I felt comfortable and I felt protected and I felt safe and my health was in complete good hands with that person. As an OBGYN, I may not be very, doing very much um, OMM or osteopathic manipulative treatments, but I have a couple of those tools in my bag as well when someone who's pregnant is suffering from some low back pain. You know, there's a couple extra little things that I could do to maybe make them feel a little bit better. Those combined really um, are helpful to me as a physician. We can get people to heal quicker by using osteopathic techniques. Someone has appendicitis. I'm still going to do traditional medicine, but I'm also going to use my hands to help further conclude and prove my diagnosis. This is accurate. Osteopathic manipulative medicine is a tool to help me diagnose. It's also a tool to treat and to incorporate into my overall practice of medicine. 
we are learning how to use these. <laughs> we are learning how to use our medical technology and the advances that happen every day in medical technology, learning how to incorporate that, but also with our most foundational skills like our hands and our stethoscopes to treat patients. I chose to pursue my training in an osteopathic medical school because we're rooted in a patient-centered philosophy and we really try to make sure that we reach each patient where they are. We treat the whole person. Being an osteopathic physician means I'm different. It truly fits who I am and what I want to be as a physician. Absolutely. Positively, emphatically, I choose DM. I choose DM. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of an idea um, about, a little more of an idea about what osteopathic medicine is. I really truly really think nobody says it better than our current students and our, our physicians. Um, at the end of the day, what I really want you to take away from that is that you have an option. There are two pathways in the U.S. to becoming a fully licensed physician, and you can choose DO or MD, and both will get you to the same goals. Um, so I know I've talked a lot about what osteopathic medicine is and physician, who they are as physicians. Um, so just some, some quick facts for you. Um, you'll see here on screen that there are more than 25,000 free medical students who apply to become a DO every year. I already mentioned to you that a quarter of the uh, medical students in the US uh, are studying to become a DO. And then on the right hand side, you'll see that we've really grown. So while we currently may still be one of the more less commonly known um, ways to become a physician, uh, we've had a 68% increase in the total number of DOs uh, in the past decade. And as of 2018, there's more than 145,000 practicing, uh, more than 30,000 medical students that are deep on the pathway to becoming a DO. And we're one of the fastest growing health professions. Uh, we're expected to represent more than 20% of all practicing physicians by 2030. So now you're probably wondering, all right, this lady has told me all about this new type of medicine or this medical school I've never heard about. I've never heard of osteopathic medical school, and this is the first time I've heard about osteopathic medicine. All I ever knew was that a doctor was an MD, which isn't true, but why should I consider to get my medical education in a DO school instead of an MD school? That's the question I get asked a lot. And I really wanna start by saying that this presentation is never, never intended to and is not about convincing you to decide that you should attend a DO school instead of an MD school. But in fact, that's never gonna be my ask of you. Today is more just about educating you on the options that you have. You have the option to choose DO or to choose MD. Uh, as you consider pursuing your dream of becoming a doctor in the United States. There are two equal pathways. The fact of the matter is that MDs and DOs have a ton in common. In fact, a lot more in common than they have different. Both require you to get a bachelor's degree. So after high school, you'll go get your undergraduate degree um, from any undergraduate institution. Uh, and that's required in both MDs and DOs prior to going to medical school. They also both require, for you, oh, get, both require you to take the MCAT exam. So just like you're taking your SATs and your ACTs to get into college, to get into medical school or a DO or an MD school, you have to take the MCAT exam. And then once you're in medical school, once you've made that jump, uh, four or six, however many years from now for, for each of you, uh, both will require four years of medical school training in medical school. So they um, also both require you, in order to be a fully licensed physician, you also have to match into a residency uh, to be in the practice. And then both MDs and DOs complete three, anywhere from three to seven years of residency in their specialty of choice. So some specialties, you know, specialties may require more years than training than others, and it probably that three to seven years. Both MDs and DOs, after they finish their residency training, can go on to a fellowship to further specialize. There are no, um, there's nothing stopping either DOs or MDs from, from going on further. Um, and then obviously they'll become physicians where they have important opportunities in hospitals, private practice, research, and much more. So what's the difference? You just told me all the ways that DOs and MDs are the same. We talked a little bit about it already, and I apologize if it's a little bit blurry, but the main difference is that DO students, in addition to taking the exact same coursework that MDs are taking for their MD counterpart, um, they also take an additional 200 hours of what we call our osteopathic manipulative medicine, or OM. That 200 hours does not lengthen their time in medical school. It's over four years of medical school. It's just incorporated into their training from day one. So, is OMM the same as our practice medicine? I get that question a lot from pre-med students. 
Um, I often get asked, so you just told me all this good stuff with the OCD and the other things to treat in some ways, but what's the, so what's the difference? What makes them different from the chiropractor? And the largest difference is that, like I've mentioned, DOs are fully licensed to practice in physicians. We can practice every specialty imaginable, and that is not the case for chiropractors. There's also philosophical differences. So chiropractors, with chiropractors, the focus is really on the spine itself and the belief that subluxation of the spinal segments are responsible for all of the problems or ailments that people are experiencing. So therefore, chiropractors' treatments are really directly, directly primary, primarily at that. A lot of what chiropractors learn in school tends to be a little bit more forceful than what you'll see DOs do in their own lab. There's a lot of cracking and articulation with chiropractors, and while DOs do learn that, um, osteopathic medicine really focuses on the whole body, so not just the spine. Um, instead of thinking about all of parts of the body that impact one's health as a whole. So like I said, in addition to studying all the typical subjects that you would expect physicians to master, osteopathic medical students take approximately 200 hours or additional hours of training in the art of osteopathic neoglutin medicine. OMM, or osteopathic neoglutin medicine, is the system of hands-on techniques that alleviate pain, restore emotion, and support the body's natural functions and influences the body's structure to help it function more efficiently. One key concept that osteopathic medical students learn is that structure influences function. And thus, if there is a problem with one part of the body's structure, function in that area, then possibly other areas might be affected. Another integral tenet of osteopathic medicine is the body's innate ability to heal itself. Many of osteopathic medicine's manipulative techniques are aimed at reducing or eliminating the impediment to proper structure and function so that the self-healing mechanism can assume a role in restoring a person's health. So a lot of uh, pre-med students or people like you often ask me, well, you know, DOs are treating mind, body, and spirit, does that lend itself to a primary care specialty? There certainly are a lot of DOs that go into that care. Um, they are not forced into primary care. There's about 57, 56, 50 to 57 percent of um, um, DOs, graduate and DO physicians, and physicians going into a primary care residency. Primary care, as we see it, is family medicine, internal medicine, or pediatrics. You can see the percent um, of actively practicing DOs um, as a distributed to go through specialties. But um, I, I really do believe that our, our physicians choose their specialties um, and that they are not pigeonholed whatsoever into into a primary care specialty if they start to be specialized. They really do practice in every specialty. So this gives you a little bit of an idea of the top five non-primary care specialties that you'll find DOs in. Um, again, this is not an exclusive or a completely inclusive list. Um, so emergency medicine, anesthesiology, OBI, surgical, surgery, we haven't had to talk, and psychiatry um, are the top five that are assumed that they should but keep in mind that DOs take into every specialty you possibly imagine. GME, or graduate medical education, so after graduation, both DOs and MDs will complete some form of GME, which is uh, residency placement. Uh, and residency placement is really important to pay students because they want to know how successful they'll be um, if they attend your institution or take your pathway to medicine. Um, so I want to highlight our match rates over the past four years. Sorry about that, that's probably going to be that. But you'll see that last year we did 99.29% of all graduated female DOs uh, placed into a residency successfully. Prior to that, it's always been over 98%. Um, for the past four years. But since we have some time, I do have a few myth busters. So as someone who is on the road talking to my students all the time, I hear a lot of myths, and I mentioned to you that there's a lot of misinformation out there. So I want to try and bust a few of those with you and make sure that you have the most um, accurate information. So you've heard all about OMM, the scams on treatment, and you're thinking to yourself, does that mean that DOs don't prescribe medicine? Does that mean that they practice a form of drugless medicine? And that's absolutely not true. Um, DOs, like I said, go to every specialty. Is it true that uh, DOs Focus on preventative medicine, yes, absolutely. They focus on me to, to not um, put, put their patients on medicine if they're popular. You know, you've heard about it in the video when you talk about sometimes the medicine can cause, uh, cause a human to not feel their function or do their, do their best properly. So there are ways that the OC take more work with the but that doesn't mean that they're not going to protect them exactly the same with their MD counterparty forces. And if you're a surgeon, um, are you really going to use OMM? That's a question we get a lot too. So, like, this is a photo of actually one of my good friends, his name's Dr. DJ Cato, and he's uh, an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, and you know, in surgery or with your surgical patients, you're not really going to use that OMM piece of your training. Um, and I want to I want to show you what Dr. Kiko's response to that is. So Dr. Kiko really believes that medical training in osteopathic medicine is ideal for surgeons. He said that the constant immersion in human anatomy and physiology through their OMM coursework consistently reinforced the basics that surgeons need to know to be successful. He said at the end of the day, he doesn't think about being better than the doctor next to him, but rather being the best surgeon he can be. And he believes that an autopathic medical training gave him the foundation that he needs to be the best surgeon he can be for his patients. Oh, here we go. This is the slide I was looking for earlier as we were talking about our match rates. I'm going to make sure, there. Make sure that you have the right data. So I sometimes hear from pre med students, you have a blood autopathic medicine, I don't have a hard time. And the data on this, this uh, slide is, is showing you that that's simply not true. Like in 2017, we have 99.34% match up here, and we have one core in 2018, 2019, we have 98.48, and this past year, 2020, we have 99.29% rate. So, 
really exciting pathways to the field of budget. Now, this is something that you really won't have to think about uh, until you're in college and preparing to go to medical school. Um, but one thing that you'll want to do as you prepare for medical school is to really think about um, getting some shadowing experience, the healthcare experience, and um, learning what, it, what a day in the life of a physician is. And because uh, DOs are less common, although not at the beginning that they're less men, um, they may be less common and a little bit harder to find. Um, so when you go to apply to DO school, there's this, this misconception that you have to have a DO letter of recommendation or letter of recommendation from a DO physician to apply, and that's really not true. So while this may not apply to each of you in this very moment, um, when you go to apply, it is important to know you don't necessarily have to have a DO letter. In fact, only six of our institutions, six of our 37 schools, require a DO letter at this point in time. So this is another question that I get a lot from CNN students, and again, something that may not be super relevant to you right now, but as you think about getting into college and later getting into medical school, when you begin your new college, um, it, or at your undergraduate institution, it's important to keep in mind that getting into medical school is really competitive, and that doesn't matter, and that's for both MDs and you. So we're going to share some of our entering class profile, um, just so that you have an idea of it both on what kind of numbers our pre-medical or our, our schools, our medical schools are looking for. Um, so that MCAT, like I said, is similar to the ACT or um, SAT, in that it's required to get into medical school, it's not similar as far as the subjects are on the task to study science, focus, and critical analysis, and reasoning skills, and psych psychology. Um, you can see the, the, the sub-stories listed there. But um, we just give you a kind of as a, as a reminder that when you get to school, focus on your studies, enjoy your time, get some awesome extra paper activities, um, and you'll be able to have a good So, you've sat through my whole presentation for the most part, and you're thinking to yourself, I really want to learn more. So aside from going to teacher.org and getting to follow on Instagram, um, I'm really excited to show you that we have a couple of upcoming events that are great opportunities for you to learn more. So they're free, completely free to register, uh, and you can log in anytime from 12 to 6 p.m. on the date. So October 15th already passed, but we still have one coming up on November 12th, and we're having an online platform. You can log in and talk to the representative admission um, folks, or literally any, there's going to be current medical students and physicians there that can answer your questions live in real time. Um, so I definitely encourage you to check out that event if you're interested in learning more after tonight. So the only thing I haven't really shared with you about osteopathic medicine is a little bit about the founder of osteopathic medicine. So Dr. Andrew Taylor Steele was actually a practicing MD in the late 1800s. His three children and his wife all died of spinal meningitis. At that point, he was really beginning to feel that the medical practices of his day often caused significant harm, and conventional medicine had failed to shed light on the ideology and effects of the disease. And this was when some of the most of the mind that in the 1800s, some of the medication was arsenic, castor oil, whiskey, and opium. So we kind of got that up, and he said, additionally, there was a lot of unsanitary surgical practices that often resulted in more deaths than cares. So he spent about 30 years devoted to studying the human body, and he really wanted to find an alternative way to treat disease. And that's when he began diagnosing and treating the muscle cell system to treat a variety of diseases and spare patients the negative side effects of drugs, among other things. And he later coined this osteopathy and founded the diverse American School of Osteopathy, which is now A.T. Hill University in First School, Missouri. So he always said, to find health should be the object of the doctor, because anyone can find disease. With that, I will open up the question box. I told you I should bring earlier during the video. I didn't feel like I would pause the video. Um, so I will do my best to answer these questions as they come in. Please feel free to um, keep putting them in. Let's see. All right. So, hi. I've researched. I'm going to read it out loud and then I'll answer it out loud as well so that everyone has can hear it. Um, I've researched this in a lot of places and everyone seems to be saying that if I get a DO rather than MD, I will have less chance of getting into a residency than my MD peers. I want to go into a more competitive specialty, such as surgery, um, and would this look, would, so would this lessen my chance of getting accepted to the residency that I want to pursue? I don't want to not get into the specialty that I love. I'm still undecided, but I know I wanted to get, want to get into a surgical specialty. That's a great question. Um, and at the end of the day, I may be biased, but I have spoken with so many current medical students, so many current physicians, and I have blog posts that I can, I can share with uh, Grace and some of the group later um, of people in highly competitive specialties that are DOs, um, and truthfully, they have no issues matching. But at the end of the day, your success, just like right now when you're in high school, your grades and your SAT and your GPA and your ACT are what's going to get you, and your extracurricular activities are what's going to get you in medical school. When you're in medical school, or excuse me, what's going to get you in college, when you're in college, your GPA, your MCAT exam, and your extracurricular activities, and your shadowing experiences are what's going to get you in medical school. When you're in medical school, your GPA in medical school, your board uh, scores, um, whether that's you're going to be working all of these exams, um, and your experience outside of the classroom are going to be what places you in the residency. So I truthfully do not believe um, whatsoever that going to DO school will lessen your chance of becoming a surgeon at all. Um, my boss, her husband is a surgeon, and he's a DO. I showed you the surgeon now. Um, there are, I mean, the list is really big on the nurse surgeons that are DOs. Um, 
and I'm happy to share more about that, but my interview is that being in the field is not less than one week. Um, it will not hurt your chances of going into a competitive specialty. And if anyone's telling you that, they simply have a done their research. Okay, so another question I'm seeing is, with there being so few BO schools, is it more competitive than an MD school for this, this reason? Uh, the, the answer to that question is no, it's not necessarily more competitive. It's definitely still very highly competitive to get one of the school, whether you go to BO or MD school. At the end of the day, it's going to be competitive, it's going to be hard, um, but, but you can do it. Um, if anything, uh, I would say that BO schools practice a much more holistic process of admission. Um, just like we train our physicians to holistically approach their patients with the mind, body, spirit, um, DO admission practices are also very holistic as they review an application. So while they're going to be looking at your GPA in undergraduate, they're going to be looking at your MCAT scores, they're going to be looking at your extra curricular activities, they're also going to be looking at your letters of recommendation and your personal statements. So they're really going to take into account everything you've done. Is there an upward trend in your GPA? You know, did, did you have a rough start and then get your, your feet under you and really boost your GPA? Um, things of that nature. So they're really going to holistically look at who you are as an applicant and what you bring to the school as a future position. Um, I'm sorry, I seem a little bit late. I'm not checking over this, but which specialties can be of you? Can I be any specialty as a year? Absolutely. You can become any private physician you want to be. If you want to be a neurosurgeon, you can be a BO. If you want to be an OBGYN, a pediatrician, a family med doc, a general med doc, um, a general surgeon, orthopedic surgeon, a dermatologist, anesthesiologist, I should really never be able to list every specialty, but there are no limits on what specialty you can practice uh, as a BO. I plan on becoming a pediatrician in the future. Which specialty would be best for me? Does it matter? Because they have so many similarities. I'm going to assume that you meant that the MD or DO better for me. Um, and at the end of the day, you need to choose your medical school on what's the best fit for you. You have options to become a pediatrician. You can go to DO school or MD school. Both will get you where you want to go as long as you do what's necessary to succeed in your coursework and on your board scores. So you can choose MD or DO. That is completely up to you. Um, both will get you to, to where you want to be as a pediatrician. Um, I want to be an MD. What undergraduate degree would you recommend to take? Well, hopefully after tonight, you'll also consider being a DO um, because both are physicians. Um, and training as uh, DO, we encourage, or excuse me, DO school, we encourage you to pursue your passion in undergraduate school um, or at college and uh, ensure that you get those prerequisite coursework. So I don't think there's a prescriptive um, pre med, certainly there are pre med tracks and a lot of pre med go into biology or uh, cell biology or um, chemistry, but, but it's not prescriptive. You don't have to do that as long as you get all the prerequisite coursework that you need. And you can find all of those prerequisite courses on PTO. Work. I know it was said already, but four years of bachelor's, then four years of medical school, and then three years of medical school. That is absolutely correct. You will be four, four years of undergraduate school. I mean, some people can finish in three years, so however long it takes you to get an undergraduate degree, then four years of medical school, and then three years of medical school. That's 100% correct. Um, okay, so this is where I'm a little bit late. What is a great score range for the MCAT? The 50th percentile is 500, so generally speaking, for our soldiers, they're more 500 is safe, but that doesn't mean that if you score under 500, you're going to be completely discredited. That's definitely not the case. Um, I think I put the, the average on screen earlier, which is about 504 in 2019. Um, but you have to keep in mind that's an average, meaning that there are students that have higher scores than that and lower scores uh, that, that get into our institutions. Are DO schools expensive? I'm going to be very honest with you. All medical schools, whether they are DO or MD, are expensive. Um, there are ways to fund your medical education. Uh, there are scholarship opportunities, uh, but medical school is an expensive process. Applying to medical school is an expensive process. Um, but definitely look into those scholarship programs. If you're into the military, there's a military program that will pay um, for all of your education to become a physician, and that's whether you go MD or DO. Um, and there is some there is a contract that you assign to serve in the military for a certain amount of time after they take your medical school. Um, there are some programs where if you go into a rural area afterwards, um, they'll help pay or subsidize your education as well. And then many of our institutions have their own individual scholarship programs that I would encourage you to look into. Um, I think it can range anywhere from, well, I don't want to give a range just because it, it generally will depend on whether it's a private or a public school. I also don't want the number to, to deter you from considering medicine. Um, like I said, MD, MD, and schools are both going to be very expensive, but any doctor that you talk to is going to tell you not to worry about the money on the front end. Definitely look into it and make good financial decisions, but if you want to be a doctor, um, it'll all work itself out in the end. Let's see. If I mention what does MD mean? It means medical doctor. Um, are the admissions processes the same between MD and DO schools? Like the interviews and such, I can ask some questions there. So uh, the admissions processes are very similar. However, there are a few differences. So when you want to apply to an MD school, you'll apply to their socialized application service called AMPAP. If you want to go to DO school, you'll apply to a class and provide um, application service called a COVID. 
Um, they're both very similar. You're going to get all the biographical information. You're going to get all the colleges you've attended. As well, uh, we'll get all of the coursework you've ever taken at your undergraduate institution, the MCAT scores, the principal statement, um, your letters of recommendation, and your resume, essentially, just like the experience section on the, um, on the uh, application. So both both processes are exactly the same. Not only are you going to get the same information, but you're going to give the same information to the application for uh, The interviews can differ from the, the, the different DO schools and the different MD schools. So some MD schools um, do it differently from other MD schools, and some DO schools do it differently from other DO schools. So all medical schools in general may hold the interview process a little bit differently, um, but both have different traffic guidelines that they have to stick to as far as offering um, acceptances at a certain time, giving you or the applicant a certain amount of time to respond once you've been accepted. Um, but there's there's definitely one-on-one -on -one interview types. There's MMI, which is multiple mini interview types. Um, every school interviews a little bit differently. And in light of COVID-19, all of our schools are offering virtual interviews right now. So that's a little bit different too, in light of the situation that we're in this day. How many DO schools are there? Do you recommend the seven years program? So there are 37 DO schools nationwide, but they have 58 teaching locations. And some of our schools have multiple campuses, and they're uh, in very different states. Do I recommend the seven years program? I believe you're asking about the three to seven years of residency after medical school. And correct me if I'm wrong, but um, it's not really about recommending the seven years as much as it is what you choose to do as far as your specialty. So specialties like family medicine or uh, pediatric don't necessarily need as much time as neurosurgery. If you want to be a neurosurgeon, your residency is going to be a lot longer than if you want to be a family med doctor. And that's up to you when you're in medical school to decide um, what specialty field you want to go into. Do you have to have your mind set on what kind of doctor you will become? That's a great question, and the answer is absolutely not. So you can go to any medical school to become every specialty under the sun. Um, and oftentimes, a lot of my medical students will come to me and say, Erin, I wanted to be a pediatrician my entire life. And then I got to third year and I started my rotation. The rotations are where in medical school you get to go through all the different specialties to kind of test them out per se. I went through my third year and I hated my pediatrics rotation. So now I have no idea what I want to do this, but I want to be third year now. So what I'm trying to tell you is that a lot of medical students don't even know what they want to do when they start medical school. Or if they do, that changes in their third year in medical school. So I hope I've answered that question, but ultimately, no. You can know that you just want to be a doctor to help people and serve patients and figure that out later. Would oncology be a specialty? I know oncology has parts to it, but would oncology as a whole be considered a specialty? Um, oncology is not a specialty, but you can do an oncology fellowship. So, you can be, so if you want to be a pediatric oncologist, you would become a pediatrician in residency and then go on and do an oncology fellowship to become a pediatric oncologist, if that makes sense. Any questions? Um, do you have any scholarship resources, or can I just look online and find them? You can definitely find them on tco.org um, and on acon.org. What treatment classes should I take to have the best chance of getting into the school? Again, I need to do this to you, but all of those are going to be on tco.org um, under the prerequisite list. It's also going to be our individual college websites. Um, so you can look at the individual school's website um, from tco to find, uh, to find all of the prerequisite classes. Is there high trauma in the field? Um, I think that I think maybe you're asking if there's high trauma in osteopathic medicine. There certainly can be if you become an emergency medicine physician or something of that nature. Uh, but again, as a DO, you just become a doctor and then you can specialize in a high trauma field if that's something that really is a field. What aspects of the DO educational system would you say make DOs more effective than MD education politically? So I want to be clear that there are good physicians, there are good doctors, and there are bad doctors. There are good MDs, and there are bad MDs. There are good DOs, and there are bad DOs. I say that to, to say that I'm not trying to tell you that DO is going to be 100% all the time more holistic than your MD counterpart. Um, MDs and DOs, I mean, I should say a lot of MDs also practice a very holistic form of medicine. Um, I'm not saying that DOs are more holistic. Um, I would say, though, that from day one in medical school, they are taught to think a lot more holistically than you'll see in the curriculum of any MD school. Um, again, many MDs are going to practice that same way. Um, so I don't, I don't want this to be about putting one professional or the other. They're both great pathways to become a physician. I mean, I think at the end of the day, I would encourage you to think about your philosophy um, and who you want to be as a physician. And if the osteopathic philosophy really resonates with you, um, definitely give it, a, give it a go and consider it as you can do with your uh, options in medical school. My question is, how do medical schools help you become the type of doctor that you want to be? So from the get-go, in undergraduate, while you're in um, college, definitely take a look at uh, the medical schools that you're interested in and their mission statement and their value statement. Um, because every medical school has a mission. And if their mission is to um, bring up the next best generation of doctors that they possibly can, uh, they really will learn and kind of spell out how they intend to do that. Uh, but 
ultimately, I think that that um, you can find your best fit in the same way that you're going to find your best fit for college. So just like you're going to shop around for colleges and go visit colleges and go to open houses, um, and you'll then decide on what college based on whether you like it, whether you felt like it fit um, with your values, uh, I encourage you to do the same as you consider medical school four years or five years or six years right now, whenever that may be. Um, shop around for your medical schools. I'm not sure if you mentioned this already, but I was wondering if there's a similar program like BSMD, but for DOs, there are some BSDO programs, and that can be found in the ChooseDO Explorer. So I know I keep sending you to ChooseDO.org, but if you go to ChooseDO.org slash Explorer, you can sort all of the DO schools based on various search criteria, but one of them is the dual degree programs that they offer. So you can find all of the BS or BA, excuse me, DO programs that are, that are on there. For the medical school expo, were those times Eastern Standard or Central time zone? They are Eastern time zone, so from 12, to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time um, are the, the medical school on November 12th and December 10th. Uh, so definitely, definitely join us for those. <laughs> if I wanted to attend DO school, could I still pursue pharmacy and would those courses be different? Uh, so DO schools are not schools that train physicians to become pharmacists. So if you want to be a pharmacist, uh, you would go to a pharmacy school. However, DOs all all medical students, neo NMDs, do take pharmacology as part of their coursework in medical school, where they learn all about the medications and what they do and, and all of that. So, so all physicians are trained in pharmacology and medication, but they are not pharmacists. That's why uh, the pharmacist is such an important player on the healthcare team, and they work hand in hand with DOs and physicians. Um, so, hopefully, that answers that question. Do DO schools value undergraduate research and clinical hours as much as allopathic medical schools when looking at other kids? Lydia, that's an awesome question. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, allopathic is another word for ND, um, osteopathic is VO. Uh, and yes, the answer is yes to your question, Olivia. We do, our DO schools do value research and they really value clinical hours, um, just as much as DO schools when they're considering, excuse me, just as much as any schools are considering you and your application. All right, I see. Thank you, Grace. So Grace just shared choosedo.org to everyone. Um, and then I just Grace, if you have a second, if you don't mind sharing the GCO Explorer too from that page, that's where they can see all of the applicants. Um, okay. If I go to the University of South Alabama, I have the same chance as someone who goes to be a school. Um, I'm assuming you mean the University of South Alabama's medical school. So if you mean their medical school, you do have the same chance of placing into residency as someone who goes to a DO school. Uh, if you're talking about their undergraduate school, then you need to still go to medical school, whether that be DO or MD. In the same chance, I assume you mean chance of placing into residency and um, just, just as a reminder, DOs matched at 99.29% last year, which was higher than MDs matched. So I think you have just as good chance, if not a better chance of matching. Um, can I become a DO outside of the United States? So there are no DO institutions uh, internationally that I'm aware of. There may be, don't quote me on that, but you can practice outside of the US as a DO. Um, the AOA, or the American Association of Colleges of, or excuse me, the American Osteopathic Association, I'm starting to say my association. The AOA manages international uh, rights, practice rights for DOs. Uh, they have a site that, that you can uh, check on to see what countries accept DOs or allow DOs to practice. But it's more than 60 countries uh, allow DOs to practice. It's not like this All right, Grace, I know we're getting close on time. So we may have to close the questions out. I don't want to keep everyone too long, but I think that I've answered some of the most pressing ones as best as I could. Do DOs offer, labor offer laboratory specialties, for example, to become a pathologist, but I have to go to an MD school. You do not have to go to an MD school to become a pathologist. One of my best friends is a DO and she's a pathologist. Um, you can go to an MD or a DO school to become a pathologist. You can go to a DO or an MD school to go to any specialty of medicine that you're interested in. I'm currently a biomedical sciences major. Do you think taking pre-med classes would best benefit me? Absolutely. If you have the time to take more pre-med coursework and to handle that coursework, definitely. But take some time to look at the prerequisites um, because if you're a biomedical sciences major, my guess is that you're already going to be taking most of the prerequisites that you can possibly do. Um, so definitely take a look at those lists and compare them to your coursework. All right. Grace, I think that ought to do it. I think I've done my best to answer those questions. So I'm going to close tonight out by thanking all of you so much for joining me. Um, it was my pleasure to hopefully share with you a lot about osteopathic medicine and the different pathways that you have to take to become a fully licensed physician or surgeon in the United States. If you have more questions, you can feel free to email me at gco at arm.org, which I just put in the chat. Um, and then hopefully we'll be reaching out to most of you with some follow-up information as well. Um, I'll answer one last question. Is there a difference in doctors who graduate from DO schools or MD schools? Absolutely not. All doctors will be, because they're both doctors and both physicians, will be offered the same. 